Today, I'm going to talk to you about web encryption. Now, this would be a very interesting topic if it were the 90s, right? Uh, the web in brought revolutionary changes in the way that people share information. But the atmosphere was very different back then. In the United States, encryption, cryptographic software that implemented encryption, was considered a munition. In fact, take cryptographic software that used security of a decent amount, such as 128 bits, it was not allowed to be exported outside of the United States. Netscape's Navigator, they had to build two versions of the software, one for use inside the United States and one for use without. And the, the software that was exported from the United States couldn't do encryption that powerful computers couldn't decrypt. Now, being able to decrypt all the communication from people around the world wasn't enough in the 90s. Um, the US government introduced this as a proposal for mobile encryption. This is the Clipper chip. This allowed mobile phones to communicate securely with encryption with one caveat, that there was a back door. There is a way for the US government, if they wanted to have access to the information after the fact, they could do it. Now, this led to what is referred to in history as the first crypto war. And there were many legal battles over open source technology that implemented cryptography. By 1996, the Clipper chip was basically defunct. And by the year 2000, export restrictions were effectively lifted. Cryptography had open source solutions, and it was available to everyone so that you could do, for example, e-commerce on the web and be secure with your passwords. Now, for the next decade, it was considered OK and a great thing to do encryption and use encryption online. Uh, TLS, the Transport Layer Security Protocol, was standardized by the IETF in 1999. And people considered it safe. Uh, there were academic papers, people like uh, Rogaway, Vaudenay, Bleichenbacher, these, they have pointed out potential flaws in the way that cryptography was constructed for the web, but it wasn't really mainstream. This was considered safe. Um, near the end of that decade, there were technologies from hackers and from developers to help point out some of the flaws in which encryption was used on the web. SSL strip showed that uh, if you typed a web address into your web browser, it would default to going to the non-encrypted version of that site. And if you, as an attacker, sat in the middle, you could prevent it from directing to the encrypted site. This tool made this very obvious. Firesheep, the next year, was a browser plugin that showed the, wo showed the world that if you were to use a website that had encryption only on the password portion, um, then it, this was not secure. So if you were to log into Facebook in 2010, HTTPS would be used for the login page, protecting your password. But you would be given a cookie that would allow you to visit Facebook for the rest of your session. And that cookie would be available over HTTP. And Firesheep made this blatantly obvious that people were able to steal authentication cookies. In 2011, Beast was revealed at the Echo Party conference in Argentina. Uh, Beast actually exploited protocol flaws that were pointed out by academics a, a decade earlier and showed that you could steal cookies by taking advantage of the way that the cryptography was constructed inside of the protocol. Now, these three things were not the only flaws and the only things that people pointed out in, in web security, in web encryption that were problematic, but they did lead to some great innovations, HSTS. This tells the browser to always use HTTPS for a site. Secure cookies. This was a way for when you authenticate to a, to a website that your authentication cookies would never be sent in plain text. And Beast, for example, was mitigated by a new version of TLS, TLS 1.1. However, TLS 1.1 was five years old by the time Beast was announced, and it wasn't widely supported. There was stagnation in the encryption market. The math was considered good, so the software wasn't considered necessary to take these new cryptographic innovations. Old browsers that did not auto-update still dominated the marketplace, and server operators really 
cared a lot about making sure that these old versions of Internet Explorer and these old versions of browsers were still able to work compatibly. There was no clear and present threat. There was no urgency. And then came June 2013. Does anybody remember what happened then? Yeah, that's right. That's when I joined Cloudflare. Right? No, no. Uh, no, this is obviously when pervasive surveillance became a known and concrete threat. Um, revelations of intelligence agencies slurping up data and stealing keys, retroactively decrypting content on the web, uh, became widely known as something that was happening. Web browsing and web browsing security was under massive attack in a way that hadn't been considered before. Now, a few months after that, the IETF got together and tried to collect a list of things to change in TLS to help make this better. Um, in the following year, they even put out a new best current practice document stating that pervasive monitoring is to be considered an, an attack. So every protocol to be used in the internet were, was to consider this as part of their threat model. Monitoring resist resistance was to be built into all new standards. Now, the open source software that helped liberate strong encryption for the world also around this time was found to have several flaws. But this isn't the worst part. The worst part was TLS protocol H for HTTPS as implemented was flawed and was flawed in various different ways. Uh, Freak, Logjam, and Poodle and Drown, these were attacks found by academics who discovered that the way that browsers implemented cryptography and servers implemented cryptography allowed you to downgrade from the more secure, more modern protocols to weaker, more compromised ones, including those 56-bit ciphers that were used in Netscape so long ago. Now, these, these were made practical and shown by different academics in the coming, the, the last three or four years. Not only were protocol problems found, but more fundamental issues were found with the TLS protocol itself. The triple handshake vulnerability showed that because TLS hadn't been formally analyzed by cryptographers, that it was actually incorrectly constructed and that there were problems that needed to be solved. When it comes to protecting web security from surveillance, this broke down into three areas. Forward security, or forward secrecy, um, the use of strong ciphers only, and formal verification. Uh, the version of TLS that was available at the time, TLS 1.2, you could configure it correctly. Um, there are guides to picking the right ciphers and configuring your web server and your web browser to use TLS 1.2 correctly, but this wasn't good enough. Um, in TLS 1.3, the goal was to codify this fix, to remove the unsafe options, and to make sure that if you were using this version of the protocol, you could not use it incorrectly. So how do we incentivize companies and people to use strong encryption while browsing the web? One way to do this is to increase HTTPS adoption. There are several hurdles for this. One is getting certificates for your sites. Uh, Universal SSL and Let's Encrypt have helped made, make automation of certificate generation and certificate issuance possible. Performance is another reason that people will use HTTPS. Some new features of web browsing, of the web, in the, the latest version of HTTP, HTTP2, are only available if you use HTTPS. So this has been working. Over 50% of web requests from Firefox, as of this year, it's now close to 55%, are HTTPS. Uh, major sites like Amazon.com and the New York Times have switched over to full HTTPS within the last year. But HTTPS is not enough. We want the security guarantees of TLS 1.3. So how else can we incentivize people to take up this new protocol when in the past they were so reluctant to do so? First, let's look a little bit at TLS 1.2. With TLS 1.2, there are two exchanges of data that need to happen before you can send your encrypted request. Um, not only that, is there were certain pieces of the protocol that were flawed. In, a, in particular, these supported cipher suites 
this is the choice of which algorithm you're going to use for encrypting your data, this was not digitally signed. This is what allowed Logjam and Freak and these other downgrade attacks to happen. So this is TLS 1.2. There are two, down, two back and forths, two round trips that have to happen between the client and server before data happens. This is TLS 1.3. There's one less round trip. That's 50% less times around the world to set things up. This is like in cryptographic terms breaking the sound barrier. And deep inside the protocol, there were several other enhancements. Uh, AEADs. This is a way to use a symmetric cipher that in takes encryption and authentication and ties it together. These are the only types of ciphers supported. Um, not only that, is the entire transcript is signed. So downgrade attacks of the sort that, was, that were placed against TLS 1.2 are not, not possible. TLS 1.3 has another advantage, which is if you visited a website before and you're coming back, you're resuming a, a connection, you can send encrypted data in the first flight. So if going from two round trips to one is breaking the sound barrier, this is, this is Mach 10 for crypto. Um, compare that. To, the, to TLS 1.2, and it's, it's a big carrot for the performance-obsessed web. Now, if you're doing an end-to-end -end connection, securely connecting from your phone or your browser to a data center, it's not just intelligence agencies that have an interest in inspecting the traffic. It's your ISP. It's antivirus. It's your corporate middle boxes that are looking for threats and looking to look inside of it. And one way in which these organizations manage to look inside and, and inspect the traffic is by performing a man in the middle of an attack. And it, earlier this year, I was involved in a research paper where we studied these attackers and how these authorized attackers were standing in the middle of TLS connections. And we found that in almost every case, they reintroduced these problems that had been fixed in the browser. Downgrade attacks and uh, weak ciphers and various issues of this sort. And not only that, it, revocation, o OCSP checking, which is a revocation mechanism for certificates, and certificate transparency, and all these great new features that evolve very quickly in modern browsers were not able to evolve as quickly in these middle box, man in the middle scenarios. And this is the not the only way in which people subvert TLS and encryption from your browser to the web server in order to do inspection. One of which is, was proposed by a banking consortium. And there were attempts to influence the TLS standard to add back the non-forward secret modes for TLS. What they wanted to do was communicate in their data center and then after the fact, decrypt the data and see if there's anything inside of it. This may sound familiar. They had this very complicated pro proposal that uh, involved this sort of a demonstration of, of how complex their systems are. So they had justifiable reasons to want to do this. Um, but the IETF said no. Surveillance, even on your own systems, is still a threat. And there's no compromising of the principles of the protocol to allow inspection. So for TLS 1.3, where is it now? Um, it's now enabled in these versions of browsers. These are beta versions, the versions that are not the general public versions, but the soon-to-be general public versions. And TLS 1.3 is available in several large web services, including Gmail, and will soon be available in Facebook. And in February, Chrome started what's called a field test, in which they enabled TLS 1.3 for a large proportion of their customer base. And we saw this. These are, this is a, a pie chart of the different versions of TLS, and you can see TLS 1. version 1 is the, the smaller slice, and it's going away. 1.1, as I mentioned, uh, was still five years old and hadn't been implemented when Beast came out. Typically, by that time, browsers jump, leapfrogged from 1.1 to 1.2. But in any case, TLS 1.3 was a significant portion of the web for a small, small period of time. What was found was that these introspecting proxies, specifically Bluecoat, were breaking TLS 1.3 connections. And so if you were using Chrome 
in a business in which TLS 1.3 was turned on and you had a blue coat device, your web connection stopped working. Because the browsers are unable to tell whether it's an intercepting proxy that's causing a connection to fail or an attack, they don't want to downgrade. And downgrading would allow TLS 1.2 to survive for a very long time. Until this is fixed, there's a stalemate in the deployment of TLS 1.3. So over the last few decades, things have evolved. Uh, from encryption technology being treated as a munition to a legal and widely adopted technology, and we've moved from a world in which encryption was naively considered safe to one in which we're aware of pervasive inspection by not only intelligence agencies, but organizations that we authorize to do so. And the question we have to ask ourselves going forward is, are we a society that prefers to inspect our data or to encrypt our data? Thank you.